Krishna because he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon Lord Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primeval cause of all causes. And the primeval cause of all causes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. And he is independent. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of the material world. Only because of him do the material universes. Temporarily manifested by the reaction to the three modes of nature. Appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Projita Kaito Vutra Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam Vedyam Vastavam Atra Vastu Sivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kim Vapurir Ishwaraha Sadyo hridi avarudya tetra. Kriti bihi susu subis takshanat. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Pibata Bhagavatam Rasam Alayam. Muhur aho raska bhuvibhavukaha. O expert and thoughtful men, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire to Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sugadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian juice was already relishable for all including liberated souls. Shinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Hridiyantak Stohi Bhadrani Vidonati Suhit Satam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures 
or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is it self-righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna who is dwelling within everyone's heart, acts as a best wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta presu bhadresu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati uttama sloke bhaktir bhavati naistaki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamao bhava kamaloba dayas chaye chete tare navidam stitvam satve prasiddhati By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lusts and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogataha bhagavat bhagavat tattva vigyanam mukta sangha sijayate When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness, becomes enlivened by devotional service, and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis siddhyante sarva samsaya siyante chasya karmani drista evatmanishwari Thus Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. Understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth Personality of Godhead. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna or from his devotee in Krishna consciousness can one understand the science of Krishna. Srimad uh, Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 17, Verse 45. Itam bhutanu bhavo yam abhimanyo sutta nripa yasya palayata shonim shonatim yugyam satrayad dikshita Maharaj Parikshit, translation, Maharaj Parikshit, the son of Abhimanyu, is so experienced that by dint of his expert administration and patronage, it has been possible for you to perform a sacrifice like this. <clears throat> Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. The Brahmanas and sannyasis are expert in spiritual advancement of society, whereas the Chatriyas or administrators are expert in the material peace and prosperity of human society. Both of them are pillars of all happiness, and therefore they are meant for full cooperation for common welfare. Maharaj was experienced enough to drive away Kali from his field of activities and thereby make the state receptive to spiritual enlightenment. If the common people are not receptive, it is very difficult to impress upon them the necessity of spiritual enlightenment. Austerity, cleanliness, mercy, and truthfulness, the basic principles of religion, prepare the ground And Maharaj Parikshit made this favorable condition. Thus, the Rishis of Naimisharanya were able to perform the sacrifices for a thousand years 
In other words, without state support, no doctrines of philosophy or religious principles can progressively advance. There should be complete cooperation between Brahmanas and Kshatriyas for this common good. Even up to Maharaja Ashoka, the same spirit was prevailing. Lord Buddha was sufficiently supported by King Ashoka, and thus his particular cult of knowledge was spread all over the world. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the first canto, 17th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled Punishment and Reward of Kali. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So this cooperation between Brahmanas and Kshatriyas, in other words, experts in spiritual advancement of society are the Brahmanas and Kshatriyas, Kshatriyas ad administrators, and they're expert in material peace and prosperity of human society. So on one, set, on one side we have uh, spiritual knowledge, uh, preceptors of spiritual knowledge. On the other side, we have experts who can bring about or who can uh, protect material peace and prosperity. Okay, so that gives a understanding of the value of uh, governmental administrators joining hands with uh, brahmanas to lead society in a proper direction. And Prabhupada says, both of them are the pillars of happiness. Yeah, because someone who understands spiritual life and, 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 and understands who Krishna is, what is the, the process of real knowledge, what is the difference between a jiva and a super soul, what is material nature, what is time. When they understand all these things, they become happy. Because by understanding these things, they avoid the sources of misery. And when the administrators, administrators of the society keep the peace and uh, are able to uh, guarantee that there will be prosperity for everyone, so now that's an ideal combination for a happy and progressive society or an Aryan society, a society whose main goal is to help everyone go back to Godhead. So Maharaj Pariksha, as an ideal leader, was able to, although give some measure of protection to Kali, still guarantee that Kali could not take any foothold in his kingdom. Maharaj Brikshit was experienced enough to drive away Kali from his field of activities and thereby make the state receptive to spiritual enlightenment. So, as long as the principles of Kali, which are meat-eating, gambling, illicit sex, and intoxication, are practiced in the, in the kingdom, the common people are not receptive to uh, Krishna consciousness. They don't see the necessity of spiritual enlightenment. That's the condition today. And it's a sad state because it just creates suffering. And there's no real material prosperity. So therefore, Prabhupada says then, austerity, cleanliness, mercy, and truthfulness, the basic principles of religion Prepare the ground for the reception of advancement and spiritual knowledge. Uh, and Maharaj Pariksit made this favorable condition possible. 
So now we can see there's an absolute necessity to have a cooperation between the leaders of the, the political leaders and and the uh, saintly Brahmanas. Then he says, Thus the Rishis of Naimashirinya were able to perform the sacrifice for a thousand years. In other words, without state support, no doctrines of philosophy or religious principles can progressively advance. There should be complete cooperation between the Brahmanas and the Chachas for this common good. Even up to Maharaj Ashoka, the same spirit was prevailing. So then he gives the example of Maharaj Ashoka, who became a Buddhist. He was a Hindu king, but he became a Buddhist. And uh, once he's converted to Buddhism, he gave up managing the kingdom after some time and became a mendicant, uh, uh, a bhikshu, a mendicant uh, uh, Buddhist uh, renunciate. And this, you know, was an amazing thing that people saw with their own eyes and it, it awakened them that maybe we should take up Buddhism ourselves. And because of that, Buddhism became prominent in India for a, for a thousand years. So Buddha appeared about 2,500 years ago and his, I guess you would call number one disciple was the king who eventually became a, Bo a Buddhist monk. So this galvanized, or, or I, I would say magnetized, it, it was like a magnet. People just uh, couldn't believe that the king became such a saintly monk, and, and they just became very, very serious about understanding the teachings of Lord Buddha, which based on uh, Ahimsa Dharma, uh, or uh, uh, ahimsa as paramo dharma, the, the the highest principle of uh, spiritual striving is become nonviolent. <clears throat> so this is a practical example, twenty five hundred years ago, of what happens if the king and the, uh, the brahmanas join together, and so. It was a fact in the time of Maharaj Brikshit, 5,000 years ago, and more or less the same model took place 2,500 years ago. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, it says, Maharaj Brikshit, the son of Abhimanyu, was so experienced that by dint of his expert administration and patronage, patronage means he's helping facilitating the brahmanas to spread their knowledge. That is, instead of t teaching junk so science and uh, atheism in schools, they, they teach uh, Vedic knowledge in the schools. And it has been possible for you to perform a sacrifice such as this. So, um, the that sacrifice is talking about the thousand year meeting of the sages in Naimasaranya to try and understand what is the best way to overcome the negative influence of Kali Yuga. Okay, so yesterday we ended up on a, on a, a big subject, which was how did Sankarachaya befuddle people to believe that uh, the spiritual world, Vaikuntha, doesn't exist. Krishna and Narayana don't exist. Uh, they are uh, not, there's no such thing as the Vaikuntha planets and Goloka Vrindavan and Krishna's pastimes and Narayana's being present on so many planets in the spiritual world, etc. There's only Brahman. How did he do it? Well, uh, I don't claim to be an expert in this subject, but I'm going to give it a try. Uh, of course, Prabhupada thoroughly explains this. I'll tell you where. First, Adi Lila, chapter 7, starting with uh, uh, 
let's say around verse 100 and, and going on for a whole bunch of verses. But uh, I'm going to take it up from, uh, I don't want to go into too many details because you just get lost. I'm starting from uh, Adi Lila chapter 7, verse 121. So, in this verse, it says, in his Vedanta Sutra, Srila Vyasadeva has described that everything is but a transformation of the energy of the Lord. Sankaracharya, however, has misled the world by commenting that Vyasadeva was mistaken. Thus, he has raised great opposition to theism throughout the entire world. So, this is the main point. Now, how did Sankaracharya uh, prove to some people that Vyasadeva was mistaken? He did it by word jugglery. And he did it in a very clever way. Very, very clever. So clever that most people uh, couldn't see the fault in it, even up till today. So, uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains, in the Vedanta Sutra Srila Vyasadeva, it is definitely stated that all cosmic manifestations result from the transformations of various energies of the Lord. Sankaracharya, however, not accepting the energy of the Lord, thinks that it is the Lord who is transformed. He has taken many clear statements from the Vedic literature and twisted them to try to prove that if the Lord or the Absolute Truth were transformed, his oneness would be disturbed. Thus, he has accused Srila Vyasadeva of being mistaken. In developing his philosophy of monism, therefore, he has established Vivartavada, or the Mayarati theory of illusion. Okay, so this is extremely clever. He rejects the idea that God has multiple energies, or Krishna has multiple energies. And he says that there's no such thing as transformation of energies as being the source of the creation of the material world. So the, how can he explain the material world? He explains it in a very simple way. It's an illusion. It doesn't really exist. In other words, if you read Sankaracharya Sarirak Basya, before you read it, you're convinced that you exist, your wife exists, your kids exist, your house exists, your 401k exists, your car exists. All these things exist. After you finish reading it, you're convinced it's all an illusion. It doesn't exist. <laughs> That's how clever Sankaracharya is, or was. And he baffled people. And it was all by word jugglery. So now we'll get into exactly how he did it. In the Brahma Sutra, or the Vedanta Sutra, second chapter, the first aphorism is as follows. Prabhupada writes this. Tad ananya tvam arambana sabdadibya. Commenting on this sutra in the Sarirak Basya, that's the Sankaracharya's commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. You don't need a commentary in the Vedanta Sutra. It's already been written. It's called Srimad Bhagavatam. That's the real commentary. But, sorry, but Sankaracharya, in order to prove that Vyasadeva made a mistake or was mistaken, he had to juggle uh, the uh, Vedanta Sutra of Vyasadeva and ignore totally the Srimad Bhagavatam. Right? And as if his Commentary is the bona fide commentary to understand the Vedanta Sutra by uh, Vyasadeva. So he says, commenting on this sutra in this Sarirak Basya, Sankaracharya has introduced the statement, Vacharam Banam Vikaro Namadyeyam from the Chandogya Upanishad 6.1.4. So he's referring to the Upanishads, which are considered the highest authority in Vedic knowledge, to debunk a statement in the Vedanta Sutra by uh, 
Vyasadeva. So he says, uh, to try to prove that acceptance of the transformation of the energy of the Supreme Lord is faulty. It's wrong to say, he's, he's going to use this verse from the uh, Chandokya Upanishad by giving a false uh, or a jugglery of words of that verse to prove that Vyasadeva made a mistake in his first aphorism of the second chapter of Vedanta Sutra. He has tried to defy this transformation of energy in a misguided way, which will be explained later. Okay, we're going to get to that. Since his conception of God is impersonal, he does not believe that the entire cosmic manifestation is a transformation of the energies of the Lord. For as soon as one accepts the various energies of the absolute truth, one must immediately accept the absolute truth to be personal, not impersonal. A person can create many things by the transformation of his energy. For example, a businessman transforms his energy to establishing many big factories or business organizations. Yet he remains a person, although his energy has been transformed into the many factories or business concerns. The Mayavadi philosophers do not understand this simple fact. Their tiny brains and poor fund of knowledge cannot afford them sufficient enlightenment to realize that when a man's energy is transformed, the man himself is not transformed but remains the same person. Not believing in the fact that the energy of the absolute truth is transformed, Sankaracharya has propounded his theory of illusion. Now, there's the Mayavadi theory of illusion and the Vaishnava's theory theory of illusion they're completely different but they say this but this, the same title is there theory of illusion so uh, when we're reading now I mean I when I when I was a new devotee I, re I read some of this I ended up after reading this believing that the Mayavadi theory of illusion was true and I didn't realize that there was a Vaishnava theory of illusion yeah. although it was there see that this Many people don't don't understand the Adi Lila chapter seven because Prabhupada is in certain places takes a long explanation to to explain what the Mayavadis believe, and sometimes because of the length of the explanation, you end up believing that's the Vaishnava philosophy, <laughs> and that happened to me to me for years, you know. And then you know I kept coming back and reading it again. And saying, wow, I don't understand this, you know. But then, little by little, I began to understand that there's a Vaishnava theory of illusion and a Mayavadi theory of illusion. So, not believing the fact that the energy of the Absolute Truth is transformed, Sankaracharya has propounded his theory of illusion. This theory states that although the Absolute Truth is never transformed, we think that it is transformed, which is an illusion. Sankaracharya does not believe in the transformation of the energy of the absolute truth, for he claims that everything is one and that the living entity is therefore also one with the Supreme. This is the Mayavada theory. So notice, it all starts from the fact that he rejects the existence of energies and focuses on the personality of Krishna and doesn't talk about he has so many energies. Then, by doing that, he creates this theory of illusion to explain the existence in the material world. And, and then that's why, after you read his, his commentary on Vedanta Sutra, you believe that the whole material world is an illusion. It doesn't really exist. So if it's not real, you can play with it then, because it's not real. So that's why someone who becomes a Mayavadi, they actually become a sense gratifier. Although the Mayavadi so-called saints reject sense gratification, but actually they don't. They go to more subtle forms of sense gratification. Say. And the less intelligent followers of Mayavadi, Mayavad philosophy, just become gross sense gratifiers because they say 
it, it doesn't really exist. And, and you know, there's no, uh, there's no responsibility here. I'm not creating any bad karma. Now, I saw this once. I was one time, long, long time ago, uh, in uh, the American Center in, in Paris. Uh, I saw this one guy. He had a cigarette in his hand, but he was meditating. He was in a lotus position, and, and the cigarette was in, in one hand. And it's, it's got like this, you know, and the cigarette is there. <laughs> and, and he's meditating. And so, I, you know, I said, this doesn't make sense. You know, this is nonsense what he's doing. So I went up to him. His eyes were sort of, well, he had his eyes closed. I went up to him, but he could feel that there was someone there, you know. And I, I said, excuse me, can I ask you a question? And I, I spoke, you know, in a soft voice. He said, go away. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I want to ask you a question. He said, get out of here. And then he opened his eyes a little bit. And I said, but I would like to ask you a question. I said, how can you meditate with a cigarette? He said, Hare Krishnas are nonsense. Get away from me. So you could tell I was a devotee. I said, can you answer the question? I said, look, you're, you're, you're a yogi. You're, you're, you're meditating at the same time you have a cigarette. And he said, this is what you do. He said, you, you guys, you're, you're not spiritual people. You want to bring everybody down on your low level. I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, you don't understand the philosophy. I said, well, can you explain it to me? He said, yes, I am not this body, so therefore I'm not smoking a cigarette. You see how they got everything mixed up, but they're using the same words that we use, see? <laughs> he said, you have no understanding of, of, of the truth. So, so you, you see, they have such a bastion of illusion that they can take the philosophy and completely twist it and justify what? Meditating with a cigarette, you see? And then I saw this again one time. We were in Sankirtan and in, in Paris. And we heard that there was some drum in the, in, the, in the distance. And I was thinking, you know, what's that? You know? and, I, and then we heard some people chanting. And, and we were going this direction, and they were coming this direction. And after a little while, you know, they were coming close to us and we were going close to them. We're chanting Hare Krishna and they're chanting Guru Dev, Guru Dev. And the guy that was playing the Madanga had a cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> this is, I mean, you can't make it up. I mean, this is true, you know. And, and then they see us and we see them and we just keep going and they just keep going past us like that. So this was another example of complete nonsense. He's got a cigarette dangling from his teeth, and he's, and he's playing the, uh, some kind of drum, and the others are chanting, Guru Dev, Guru Dev. And they, were, they were followers of Guru Maharaji, who was a nonsense person. I won't even talk about him. Uh, he fell down. Anyway, he's a complete nonsense person. But he was an Indian. Right? And his following became very popular at the same time as Krishna consciousness was becoming very popular. But they eventually fell apart. Okay, so let's get back to this. It says, Sankaracharya does not believe in the transformation of the energy of the absolute truth, for he claims that everything is one and that the living entity is therefore also one with the supreme. This is the Mayavad theory. Srila Vyasadeva has explained that the absolute truth is a person who has different potencies, has many potencies, many energies, merely by his desire that there be creation and by his glance sa aikshata the Vedic uh, verse, he created this material world, sa asrijata. Asri, asri After creation, he remains the same person. He is not transformed into everything. One should accept that the Lord has inconceivable energies and that it is by his order and will that varieties of manifestations have come into existence. Okay, so this is the basic argument, right? The basic point. Now, we'll make, I'll give some examples to understand this. So, 
he says, one should accept that the Lord has inconceivable energies and that it is by his order and will that varieties of manifestations have come into existence. In the Vedic literature, it is said, satatvato nyata buddhir vikara iti udadrita. This mantra indicates that from one fact, another fact is generated. Okay, now here come the examples. For example, a father is one fact, and a son generated from a father is a second fact. Thus, both of them are truths, although one is generated from the other. This generation of a second, independent truth from a first truth is called vikara, or transformation resulting in a byproduct. The Supreme Brahman is the absolute truth and the energies that have emanated from him are existing separately such as the living entities the cosmic, and the cosmic manifestation which are also truths. This is an example of transformation which is called vikara or parinama. So you can call it either vikara or parinama. To give another example of vikara or transformation, milk is a truth but the same milk may be transformed into yogurt. This yogurt is a transformation of milk, although the ingredients of yogurt and milk are the same. Okay? In the Chandogya Upanishad, there is the following mantra, Aitad Atmyam Idam Sarvam. This mantra indicates without a doubt that the entire world is Brahman. The absolute truth has inconceivable energies as confirmed in the Svitasvatara Upanishad, Parasya Sakti Vividayava Shriyate, and the cosmic, the, and the entire cosmic manifestation is evidence of these different energies of the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord is a fact, and therefore whatever is created by the Supreme Lord is also factual. Everything is true and complete, Purnam, but the original par Purnam, the complete absolute truth, always remains the same. Purnat, Purnam Udachite, Purnasya, Purnam Adaya. The absolute truth is so perfect that although innumerable energies emanate from him and manifest creations which appear to be different from him, he nevertheless maintains his personality. He never deteriorates under any circumstances. So this is the philosophy here of Vaishnavism as opposed to what Sankaracharya uh, created his theory of illusion, Vivartavada. <clears throat> so it is to be concluded that the entire cosmic manifestation is a transformation of the energy of the Supreme Lord, not of the Supreme Lord himself or absolute truth himself. So, so Sankaracharya rejects the existence of energies and says there's one truth that is Brahman. And if you say Brahman transforms, you'll you're, you're making a mistake because Brahman is one. It can never be, uh, it can never be diminished. And therefore, uh, we, whatever you see that's in the material world is actually an illusion. It doesn't really exist. Okay, so now, uh, this is also explained. Uh, Ramanuja Charya, to defeat uh, the Saridak Bhasya of, of Sankaracharya, he quoted a verse from the Taittiriya Upanishad that states, Yatova imani bhutani jayanti yena jatani jivanti, and so forth. This mantra confirms that the entire cosmic manifestation emanates from the absolute truth, rests upon the absolute truth, and after annihilation, again re-enters the body of the absolute truth, the Supreme Personality Godhead. The living entity is originally spiritual, and when he enters the spiritual world or the body of the Supreme Lord, he still retains his identity as an individual soul. In this connection, Sripad Ramanujacharya gives the example that when a green bird enters a green tree, it does not become one with the tree. It retains its identity as a bird, although it appears to merge with the greenness of the tree. To give another example, the animal that enters a forest keeps its individuality, although apparently the beast merges with the forest. Similarly, in material existence, both the material energy and the living entities of the marginal potency maintain their individuality. Thus, although the energies of the Supreme Personality Godhead interact with the cosmic manifestation, 
each keeps its separate individual existence. Merging with the material or spiritual energies, therefore, does not involve loss of individuality, according to Sri Ramanuja Pada's theory of Vesista Advaita. Although all the energies of the Lord are one, one each keeps its individuality, Vesistya. That means that both the material energy and the living entities are uh, individually constituted and their individuality does not disappear. Now, you can understand that about the living entity, but he says the same thing about the material energy, and that's where it's an amazing statement. What does the material energy mean? It means earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, and intelligence. So these seven coverings of the material world uh, are individual things that exist. Uh, sometimes they're manifest, sometimes they're not manifest. You notice I didn't mention false ego because the false ego is something false. There's real ego, but the real ego is not a covering of the material world. What the false ego is, and a false ego is identifying oneself as matter rather than spirit. Okay, so now, uh, this was also explained by Lord Chaitanya, by, by Mother Sachi to Lord Chaitanya. And, and uh, that is in, that's in Adi Lila chapter 14. So Lord Chaitanya started speaking uh, Mayavad philosophy. <laughs> so when his mother caught him eating some dirt, uh, she said, uh, he, he, and she came running toward him to stop him, and, Krish, and Lord Chaitanya was crying, and he inquired from his mother, why are you angry? You have already given me dirt to eat. What is my fault? And then he started preaching. He said, fused rice, sweetmeats, and all other edibles are but transformations of dirt. This is dirt, that is dirt. Please consider, what is the difference between them? This body is a transformation of dirt, and the eatables are also a transformation of dirt. Please reflect upon this. You are blaming me without consideration. What can I say? So Prabhupada explains in the purport, this is an explanation of the Mayavada philosophy, which takes everything to be one. The necessities of the body, namely eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, are all unnecessary in spiritual life. When one is elevated to the spiritual platform, there are no more bodily necessities. And in activities pertaining to the bodily necessities, there are no spiritual considerations. In other words, the more we eat, sleep, have sex, and try to defend ourselves, the more we engage in material activities. Unfortunately, my body philosophers consider devotional activities to be bodily activities. They cannot understand the simple explanation in Bhagavad Gita, mam chayo vibhichari na bhakti yogena sevite sagunam samatita itam bhamabhuyaya bhakalpate. Anyone who engages in spiritual devotional service without motivation, without personal desires, rather only the desire to please Krishna, rendering such service for the satisfaction of the Lord is elevated immediately to the spiritual platform and all his activities are spiritual. Brahma Bhuyaya refers to Brahman, spiritual activities. Although Mayavadi philosophers are very eager to merge into the Brahman effulgence, they have no Brahman activities. To a, in other words, they don't engage in devotional service. To a certain extent, they recommend Brahman activities, which for them means engagement in studying the Vedanta and Sankhya philosophies, but their interpretations are but dry speculation lacking the varieties of spiritual activity. They cannot stay for long on that platform of simply studying Vedanta or Sankhya philosophy. So remember when Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya saw Lord Chaitanya, who was chanting in the streets, he felt sorry for him. That he's, he's a sannyasi, but he's wasting his time doing this sentimental nonsense, chanting and dancing. And then he tried to convince Lord Chaitanya to give it up and, and just stick with the study of Vedanta. <laughs> you see. So, uh, therefore, 
Mother, uh, Mother Sachi astonished that the child, Lord Chaitanya, was speaking Mayavada philosophy. Mother Sachi replied, who has taught you this philosophical speculation that justifies eating dirt? In the philosophical discourse between mother and, and the son, when the son said that everything is one, as impersonalists say, the mother replied, if everything is one, why do people in general not eat dirt, but eat the food grains produced from the dirt? Okay, now we're getting into a ref refutation of the Mayavad philosophy. Replying to the Mayavada idea of the child philosopher, Mother Sachi said, my dear boy, if we eat dirt transformed into grain, our body is nourished and it becomes strong. But if we eat dirt in its crude state, the body becomes diseased instead of nourished and thus it is destroyed. In a water pot, which is a transformation of dirt, I can bring water very easily. But if I poured water on a lump of dirt, the lump would soak up the water and my labor would be useless. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. This simple philosophy propounded by Sachimada, even though she is a woman, can defeat the Mayavadi philosophers who speculate on oneness. The defect of Mayavad philosophy is that it does not accept the variety that is useful for practical purposes. Sachimata gave the example that although an earthen pot and a lump of dirt are basically one, for practical purposes the water pot is useful whereas the lump of dirt is useless. Sometimes scientists argue that matter and spirit are one, with no difference between them. Factually, in a higher sense, there is no difference between matter and spirit. But one should have the practical knowledge that matter, being an inferior state of existence, is useless for our spiritual blissful life, whereas spirit, being a finer state, is full of bliss. In this connection, the Bhagavatam gives the example that dirt and fire are practically one and the same. From the earth grow trees, and from their wood come fire and smoke. Nevertheless, for heat, we can utilize the fire, but not the earth, smoke, or wood. Therefore, for the ultimate realization of the goal of life, we are concerned with the fire of the spirit, not the dull wood or earth of matter. So then Lord Chaitanya says to his mom, why did you conceal self-realization by not teaching me this practical philosophy in the beginning? <laughs> so anyway, you see, uh, the Mayavadi philosophers do not really attain Ananda Maya Byasad. They, they attain what's called Vijnana Maya, but not Ananda Maya. Vijnana Maya means that you understand with your mind and intelligence uh, higher order principles of spiritual life, but you don't realize them through practical devotional service. So when you realize them through practical devotional service, you, you attain this transcendental state called Ananda Maya Biasa, transcendental happiness, jolliness, uh, not frivolousness, but you become transcendentally happy. The Mayavadis fall down because they never reach that higher state. Although they have a certain amount of understanding, but they don't have the actual practical devotional service by which one establishes a relationship with Krishna. Therefore, Krishna says uh, that with, uh, he can only be understood by devotional service and not in any other way. Okay, so I did not want to make a long presentation of this subject. I just wanted to give the main ideas. If you want to read chapter 7 of the uh, Adi Lila and chapter uh, 14 of the uh, uh, Adi Lila, then you get the full picture of uh, the, the defeat of Mayavad philosophy. Are there any questions? I got one from the internet. Huh? Yeah. Uh, wanted to ask if Sankacharya, uh, Sankacharya taught that we merge into Brahman is liberation. How come he said that the Brajagovindam verse in this departure? Wait a minute, I'm not Braja following Govindam. you. Sankacharya said you can attain liberation by merging into Brahman. What comes after that? 
Uh, and is merging into Bra Brahman liberation? It's what? Is it liberation? Oh, I see what you mean. Well, uh, it's like this. Let's say you get in a rocket ship to go to Mars. And the rocket ship takes off safely. You're in space. You're going toward Mars. But somehow or other, some, somebody made a mistake, and you go past Mars. So now you're just going in space. What would happen to you? You would eventually die, because you didn't land on any planet. Right? So that's what happens to the Maya bodies. They, go, they, they, they may attain. Some of them may attain the Brahman realization, but they don't believe there's any Vaikuntha planets. So they never have any ashraya, any shelter. So eventually, as soon as they're just floating in that, in that space, eventually, if they develop any desire at all, they fall down. And it's inevitable that they will have some desire. Because they're not getting any Anandamaya Bhyasat, transcendental happiness, just by floating in space. Just like it would get boring if you missed uh, landing on Mars and you're just going into outer space without any, uh, any uh, uh, destination. You get the point? So even though the position of Brahman is liberation, because they have incomplete understanding of what is in the uh, what is the source of Brahman, they eventually fall down. I, uh, I don't know if I'm wrong. I think Speak it's closer to the microphone. It's too very loud. Close, very close, very loud. No, that's all right, because people have to hear it. Okay. I don't know if uh, I misunderstood the question, but I think it's referring to Sayuja Mukti, liberation or merging. No, it's a, that's one of the of, the, of liberation, Sahuja Mukti. You know that question, no? Referring to that? We're talking about Maya bodies. We're not talking about bona fide impersonalists. Now, according to the question. The, the question is, is the merging of the Maya bodies liberation? Okay. So, it's not permanent. Liberation real liberation is permanent. Like you can go to a heavenly planet and call that liberation, but eventually you'll fall down. And you can merge with the Mayavadi concept into Brahman, but you'll eventually fall down because you have an incomplete concept of what is liberation. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. The yeah. second part of her question involves um, Braja Govindam, Braja Govindam, Mudha Mate. Yes. Does that uh, relate to merging into Brahman? No. Sankaracharya is actually Lord Shiva. And he had a thankless task of misleading the, uh, the uh, people with a Buddhist-like interpretation of Vedanta Sutra. He reestablished the authority of the Vedanta, but he gave a Buddhist-like explanation of it. But after all of that, he actually spoke the truth also. He said, look, just give up all this word jugglery. Like that, but that's what he did. We just went over it. He, he, he juggled words. He said, just give up all this word jugglery and just surrender to the Lord Krishna or Govinda and chant the holy name of the Lord. So, I mean, I didn't want to read all of this, right? I mean, the, the Prabhupada goes into every little detail. His disciple, Sadhananda Yogindra, wrote a book, uh, and in that book, he codified the Mayavad philosophy again, but and this time, this time he said, and I've explained this before, that Krishna is the Tamasa Bodhi, the sum total of ignorance, and unless you reject Krishna, you cannot attain Brahman realization. Okay. So that's explained here. I, I didn't want to go into all that detail. If you want, we can go into that detail like tomorrow, and the next day it would take a couple days to, to, to go through it all. 
So he diverged, or he, he, he uh, let's say, didn't listen to Bhaja Govinda, Bhaja Govinda, the last instruction of Sankaracharya, but he doubled down on the word jugglery, uh, the Sarirag Pasya, and formulated it in such a way that uh, uh, it's become the, the basis of the Mayavad philosophy in, in, this, in this age. See? So he formulated the, uh, uh, the idea that there's only one thing that's Brahman and everything else is an illusion. Although that's what Sankaracharya wrote, but now he went further. He said that this Krishna, you have to reject him in order to attain Brahman. Because he is the Tamasa Bhuti. So he gave a false interpretation of who Krishna is. And other things to, to keep people on the track of Mayavad philosophy. So uh, Sankaracharya is actually an Acharya. He's, he's, he's actually a, a great devotee, right? He had this thankless task of getting rid of the, Muslim, of the, of the Buddhists and, uh, and reestablishing the authority of Vedas. Because Buddha, although he's, he's an incarnation of Krishna, he rejected the Vedas because the Hindus or the Vedic Brahmanas uh, uh, 2,500 years ago were not following the Vedas correctly and they were making money by doing animal sacrifices and all kinds of nonsense. So rather than argue with them and, and, and you know, when, when, when someone's making money doing something false, it's very hard to convince them to stop it, right? So he, uh, he just pulled the, wall, the rug out from their feet and said, well, I reject the Vedas, right? If that's in the Vedas, I reject it. And he, he rejected the Vedic authority and he, and he taught uh, ahimsa paramo dharma, that the highest principle of religiosity is nonviolence. And he was able to convince uh, Ashoka, or Ashoka became convinced, and now you have the, the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas together and the whole of India became Buddhist in the, in the, for a thousand years. And Sankaracharya predicted that it would only be valid for a thousand years. And then along comes Ramanujacharya and uh, later Madhvacharya and then later Lord Chaitanya and completely defeated the Buddhist interpretation of Vedic knowledge. Right. So, uh, Sankaracharya basically gave a Buddhist-type interpretation of the Vedanta Sutra. And then, uh, uh, so the question is, why did he say Bhaja Govindam, Bhaja Govindam? Because he's an Acharya and he, he told the truth, even though he used this, just like how did Krishna convince his father to give up Indra Puja? He used the karma, false karma mimamsa philosophy to convince his father. And then he directed his father to worship Govardhan, and then he proved that Govardhan is non different than him. So, in the same way, Sankaracharya used the Buddhist like interpretation of the Vedas to convince people to give up Buddhism and accept uh, you know, this Mayavad philosophy. And he, ex he, 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 he Reestablished the principle, uh, the, the the authority of Vedanta, but he gave the false representation of it. But he did what he was supposed to do. He got rid of the Buddhas and reestablished the authority of the Vedas. Then uh, Ramanujacharya came and Madhvacharya and, and reestablished the correct understanding of the Vedas. So it's like, you know, it's like a a, a circle, right? You start at one point and then you go 180 degrees uh, to another uh, uh, you know, point and then you come back again. So uh, that's what happened. Now, it happened over a period of uh, a thousand years, well, more than a thousand years, let's say at least 2,000 years. First of all, there was a deterioration of Vedic Dharma and then there was the opposite of it and then it was debunked, and you came back to the Vedic Dharma. So, but that's not a long time. If you consider the, the, the time of the material creation, like the entire life of Brahma, 
that 1,000 years is, or 2,000 years is, is nothing. For us, it seems like a lot, but in, in, according to, to uh, the universal time, it's nothing. It's just a, it's, it's, it's not even a second. Any other question? Yeah. Mr. Maharaj, uh, Mahaprabhu said, Maya Vadi Bhasasunali Hoi Sarvanash. We shouldn't listen to. If you listen to my word philosophy, philosophy, you risk never understanding Krishna consciousness. So you think uh, for the, the the beginners in Vaishnavism or devotional service, if they hear those parts, those quotations from my word, can they be? Uh, well, I gave you an example of myself. You know, <laughs> I read it, and I ended up thinking that the Mayavad philosophy was our philosophy. You know, <laughs> it took me years so to get, get the, you know, the Brahma Satyam Jagat Mitya. I thought that was our philosophy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, you, you need someone to explain it to you. Right. right. If you just read it on your own, you could get mixed up. You can say, yeah, they may be all right. Huh? You can think they may be all right. Yeah. Know, no, but, no, I, there's so much <laughs> Sanskrit quoted, right? right. There's uh, Vivarta, uh, Vada, and there's uh, uh, Parinama Vada. Parinama. I, you know, I get it all, all mixed up in my <laughs> mind, right? <laughs> so it's very easy to get the whole, and then, you know, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mitya, it's Sanskrit, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I I was so mixed up that I thought that was our philosophy. <laughs> yeah. No, you have to have the help of a, a genuine Vaishnava. Otherwise, you can get easily misled. Very subtle, yeah. Very subtle. No, I mean, to understand that he rejects the energy of of of, of God and thinks and, and just focuses on the personality of God. Uh. But wait a minute, that's <laughs> Okay, that sounds good, but it's it's not it's not a fact. You can't if you <coughs> reject the inconceivable energy of God, you become a Mayavadi right away. Right? How how can he create the world <coughs> just by looking at it? Right? That that means he he has infinite energies and he can expand them as he wants, right? And he can do it just by looking or thinking. Uh, that's beyond our capacity, right? We've never met anyone like that, right? Mm -hmm. So how can we believe believe it? Well, it's very easy to say. Well, it's just fairy tales. You know, it's all illusion. Uh, there's only one thing, and that's Brahman. So that's why the Mayavadis they don't believe in varieties, right? Yes. Yeah, they think it's all illusion. Uh, yeah. That's why I said you begin to read this book, his Sariag Basya. Before you read it, you think all these things exist. And when you finish reading, it, it's all an illusion. Okay, if it's all an illusion, I can play with it, I can do whatever I want, you know, and I'm not, not going to be held responsible. It's yeah. not real. <laughs> Haribo. That's very good for a sense of gratifying, is very. It's use a wonderful that. philosophy. That's why the guy's <laughs> holding his cigarette and meditating, or a cigarette dangling from his mouth, he's playing Madunga. Very easy to, to get into that. Yeah. Holy, yeah. oh, great. <laughs> it's a nice philosophy, right? You have a question? 